Puno puta kad ja kažem ljudima da imam dvoje dece, oni kažu, ma nemoj, ja imam dvoje dece. Jedan laje, a drugi mauče. I have a cat and a dog, that's it. Ali sada mogu da vam kažem, od idućih, ne, 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 before, how do you say before, now I'm forgetting. Od prije petka, moja supruga i ja smo bili kod doktora i videli smo da je ona pregnant. So, for real, she's actually pregnant. Now I can say we may have a real child coming up, not just a dog and a cat. As much as I love them, not that much. <laughs> it's been incredible to be here with you. I'm encouraged just seeing this place packed. There's literally no space for anyone. Um, but I've been asked to just see if there is any space in your row. Could you scoot out to the side. If you could just scoot out to the side, if there's any space in your row, just to make a little bit more room for people, that would be great. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, your love, compassion on us. God, this day, this very hour, Father, we're praying that you would make yourself evident to us. Lord, we hunger after so many things. We hunger for everything except at times it seems you. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would shake us, that you would wake us up, that your word would become clear as we comprehend who you truly want us to be and what you really want want us to hunger after. Lord, our affections seem so weak. God, our affections seem to be so consumed for things that have nothing to do with the grandeur, the magnitude, the beauty of what you want for us. And so, Lord, awake our affections. Awake our desires to come alive. Holy Spirit, work in us and through us to wake up to your story, which is our true story. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says the following. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world. On June 15, 2013, Brianna Mitchell stalled in her SUV late one night, and she, along with her friend Shelby and her mom Holly, were sitting on the side of the road with their signal lights on. It's late at night. Here are these women out in their car, and there happens to be a youth pastor that's driving by with his two kids, and he sees them in the distance, the lights on, as a pastor, maybe should, he stops. And there he gets out, seeing what's going on. That same night, Ethan Couch, 16 years old, had been out to the Walmart in that neighborhood and stole a case of beer with his buddies as they were having a party at his parents' guest house, which was so large it had three rooms in it, a guest house on the same property some distance away and there he threw an incredible party for him and his buddies and his girlfriend and there they got intoxicated his girlfriend said hey I need to grab something from the store uh, I better go grab something and I'm just going to make my way out Ethan's like no let me let me take you in his drunken stupor he gets into the car of his dad's work truck in F450 a huge truck and as they get inside, they speed off only half a mile from his home, swerving left and right, and he nails right 
into Brianna Mitchell's SUV, killing not only Brianna, not only her friend, not only her friend's mom, Holly, but the pastor as well. You see, in this world today, there can be a problem when we measure success by simply attaining worldly things that this world has to afford. Ethan was a boy of privilege. His family came from seemingly exterior measures of great quality. They had a great deal of success. Ethan grew up in a family that was privileged economically, educationally, socially, but they abused their success in life. His father said to him one day, we have the gold, we make the rules, Ethan. I don't say this to mock success. I don't say this to undervalue achievement. Many of you sitting in these pews have done so much, have achieved much. You have accomplished greatly coming from former Yugoslavia, coming to this country and making something of yourselves to be proud of. I'm not making light of that. The report on the case, the CNN debrief said, Ethan eventually pleaded guilty to four counts of intoxicated manslaughter for killing Brianna, Holly, Shelby, and Brian. Two counts of intoxication assault for the teenagers who were injured that were in his car that were thrown from the bed of the truck as it flipped. The psychologist on the case, Dr. Miller, remarked, Ethan's story is one of a sad repercussion for a privileged teen who grew up in a dysfunctionally wealthy home with little boundaries and authority, suffering from what he called affluenza. Affluenza denotes a monetary disease of ailment, which is defined as a hyperinvestment in material wealth causing illness. It's not a disease like we think of, but it's an actual dis-ease with life. When making money and attaining prestigious titles, degrees, careers, and attaining material goods such as homes, luxuries, vacations that are costing tens of thousands, the scorecard for these individuals is judged by their success to achieve much. In June of this very summer, Kate Spade, the fashion designer, took her life. Worth over a hundred and million, 150 million dollars. Her designer bags and purses and dresses may be on some of you this morning. Two days later, Anthony Bourdain takes his life. Prestigious spot on CNN's time frame. He was doing cooking shows that people absolutely loved at the peak of his success. How is it that these successful individuals would take their life? They had attained so much. My wife, I have to tell you, I am so proud of her. She has done so much hard work to get where she is. And sometimes we talk about, man, this, this really costs a lot for you to do what you're able to do in terms of time, energy, energy. And fuel. And she says, Philip, you know what? There's just one thing I always have to say. Never envy those who have succeeded much because the sacrifice to get there has been great. I believe that. I really do. But when your attainment of this great status, this greatness, requires you to bend everything in your life morally, ethically, and socially in order to achieve it, is it really worth it? Now before you think that this is not your story, this is not my life, these aren't my kids, this couldn't happen in my family, I want you to take a reality check. You see, I love the title of, of uh, Pastor Ortberg's book. It's called, Everybody's Normal Until You Get to Know Them. Absolutely every one of you here is normal. But if I were to spend a moment just hearing your true story, you'd find out, uh, not that normal. 
You see, because the life of our real story, our real life is actually very messed up. It's very confusing. It's very chaotic. There's a lot of suffering and complexity. But you know what? The thing is, I want each of you to remember where you live. You live in Toronto. Toronto is 10th on the most competitive financial center in the world. Marking its colleagues, Beijing, Hong Kong, New York, San Francisco, for financial wealth and status. In the U.S., the Census Bureau says that 40% of Americans are at this level deemed affluent, which means making more than $75,000 U.S. dollars per year. In a home of two people working a professional job, that's not very difficult to attain. And so when I think of the people who are sitting in these pews, I bet some of you might just be like that. You actually are termed affluent. Affluent? Me? Really? I didn't feel like I was affluent. But you see, when almost half of the world lives on $1 a day, you are very affluent. In India, there are people who are called the untouchables. These individuals are born into a caste system society that simply on your birth name, all your job is to do in life is to shovel crap. Literally, that's all these individuals do. People are not even allowed to touch them. They're that untouchable because there's gross. Oh. So when you think of us who are in this church, we absolutely are blessed more than we even understand. You see, one thing we have to consider in this culture of affluence, that we don't forget that our goal is not attaining more. Because our life is really short. Really short. You see, Solomon says all is vanity. All is vanity. I think of vanity as like a spray. As quickly as it comes out, it's gone. Did you see that? Oh, you didn't see it? It's because that's our life. Where'd it go? It's gone. Wait, it's gone. Okay, now it's smelling too much here. Thank you, Pastor Gordon. This is a very nice cologne. <laughs> okay. But you see, that's the type of life that we live. As soon as we think we've done something of significance, time is over. I'm already turning 32. And I thought, man, I, now I'm talking pastor goals, okay? So some of you are like, oh gosh. I thought maybe by 30 I would have baptized a thousand people, written three books, you know, been at this place. And oh man, I had all these crazy goals when I was 20 going into ministry. Time goes by like this. I haven't have achieved anything. Life is but a spray. It comes out, it's gone. How easy is it for us to have a dis-ease with life that can lead us to yearning for things that are truly needless, meaningless, and for nothing? But you see, before you start thinking, ah, man, I don't know, it's not really part of my life. If you're anything like the life of Scripture, of the original parents, this is your life too. Let me share with you five needless mistakes that the original family made that I think we need to pay attention to. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6. I want us to pay attention here to see and understand five needless mistakes they made that we likewise make living in a consumer world. Jump with me into verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Stop for a moment. Two mistakes already emerge. Number one, 
Eve assumed Satan was harmless. She assumed he was harmless enough to talk to. This beautiful creature. But scripture calls Satan a roaring lion. I had a dream one night. I share this story often because I couldn't believe how much it really speaks to what's happening in my life and maybe in yours. I was preparing for a sermon and I couldn't think of an illustration for the very beginning. And this one night it came to me as I was in the dream, I was struggling and the dream came out. There I was in a mountain region, a beautiful home here in Muskoka, two hours away. And this, imagine a cabin out there and there's this prairie around you, a lake in the far distance. And there I was in this home with my family some church members and others that I knew around me. It was beautiful. And there we sat together laughing and talking, and all of a sudden someone looked out the window and said, hey, is that a lion out there? A lion. And they started looking out there, and sure enough, not just one lion, but there were many. Everyone started grabbing their cell phone, their cameras, taking pictures. Oh my goodness, look at that out there. Can you believe it? Snap, snap. And now all of a sudden, these lions start getting closer and closer and closer to the house. People not thinking anything, still laughing, taking pictures. And someone forgot to leave the back door closed. And as they're taking pictures, one of the lions gets to the back of the house and starts pawing its hand through the open sliding door. All of a sudden, that sliding door wakes straight open and the lion emerges going straight through the house. Now the lions start entering the home. The cameras are thrown to the ground. People start screaming, running. The lions are slashing at people. Blood. And then I run into a closet and hide all the way at the top. That's the pastor hid in a closet, leaving his church members out there to die. And I awoke with a lion and its paw right on my face. The first mistake we make is assuming that Satan is harmless. The first mistake we make is assuming Satan is harmless. Scripture says that he is a roaring lion looking to whom he may devour. He wants your life. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to take your children and rip you apart. He wants you to die. He is not harmless. And yet, we seem to fall for his tricks so easily. Why? Because we assume the things of this world are harmless. Number two, she listened to him and gave him space to speak. Truth says, rebuke the devil and he will. Not many people seem to know that in English maybe, huh? I don't even know what it is in several Croatian. But. Rebuke the devil and he will flee from you. Jump into verse two. Of Genesis 3. Then the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of every fruit on the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat of the fruit on the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it, or else you will die. You will not certainly die, said the serpent to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. One theologian puts it, the creature always seems to forget that it's a creature, yearning to be God when it was only created. 
Here, Satan was trying to in, in capture Eve and realizing, no, you are like God. Lie number three is believing what Satan says. You're worthless. You didn't achieve anything in your life. You don't look beautiful. Your wife doesn't love you. Your kids hate you. You think this church does anything for you? The lies that we repeat in our minds. The lies that Satan speaks to us. But scripture says that Satan is the father of all lies. That's number three. Jump in now to verse 6. And here we see, when the woman saw that the fruit on the tree was good for food and pleasing. Let me stop you there for a moment. I want to remind you of a Bible text. Famous Bible text. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world. You see, sometimes from pulpits you'll hear this. Watch out for the world, man. It's going to take you. Oh, you better be careful. But you see, the thing is, Jesus loves the world. Why? Because he created it. Everything in it is his. It's only humans that choose to do what they want with the world that he's created. So when Eve looked at the tree and said, wow, it looks beautiful. Of course it looks beautiful. God created it. He made it. He made all things. Paul says all things are good, but not all things are profitable for me. Right? There are all things that you can do. There are different ways you can make money. Sure, you can go sell drugs in a corner, but you can also steal money from other businesses in some ways. You can do all kinds of things, but not all those things are good. So when Eve looks at the tree and she says, oh, the fruit was good. Pleasing to the eye. Mm. That's where the problem then emerges. Pleasing to the eye. Paul said, do not be conformed to this world. The problem is when the world starts to become pleasing. I found myself addicted to a game. Think of a game that maybe you really like. Some of you maybe don't play games anymore. But I did in high school. I found myself addicted to this game. It consumed me. I wanted to play it more than anything else. Can I tell you what the game is? It was Pokemon. Man, I played that thing on my Game Boy Color till I beat it 30 hours later. It's a frivolous idea, but different things consume us so much so, find pleasing to the eye that it becomes your utter and only desire. What is that for you? What is that for you? She looked at the fruit and found it pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it. The problem then also emerges when we look at things of the world and say, man, look at how they found success. I can find success like that. Absolutely, it's possible to do that. But when it has to do with something that isn't of God, it's not success any longer. She looked at it, took it, And she gave also some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The fourth lie and mistake that the original family made here is that they indulged the desires of their hearts. But what does Scripture say? The heart is deceitful above all things. I found myself being asked by one of my family members at one point, do I look beautiful? It's like, of course you do. I won't say who the person is. Not that you couldn't guess, maybe. Do I look beautiful? Do I look nice in what I'm wearing? Of course you do. And 
And this person kept asking me these questions. I'm like, what, what is going on here? Why are you asking me all these questions? And I realized this family member of mine was around these unique friends that she had at the time. And they just kept influencing her by their conversations about Oh, man, I just, I don't look good. I don't feel, oh, uh, you know. And all of a sudden, this desire came out of this person. I'm like, where is this coming from? You see, Satan is like that. He surrounds us with seemingly innocent things, evoking desires within you. An ad on the computer, fathers, men in the room, seems innocent. But then with one click, you're taken into a world of darkness and despair like you've never, ever been before in. Seeming desires evoked, and Scripture says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Number five, though, the mistake that they made was sharing the sins that they engaged in. It's really easy. When you do something bad, You don't want to be the only one who's done it, right? When I was in elementary school, I found myself stealing a lot. And I didn't want to steal by myself, so I got my buddies to steal with me. Isn't that better? Now you have two thieves. And we would steal together, and it felt like we were in this together. Sin always feels better when you're doing it with someone else. When you're not alone. But scripture says you will not be tempted above what you can handle. These five mistakes emerged. They may emerge in your life at different points. But don't be shocked when you find verse 23 coming alive. In your life actually. Genesis 3:23 and there it says so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken what why would God banish anyone why would God cast anyone aside how dare God society may say i thought it's supposed to be a god of love but if you read Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, it says there that the pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see God. Purity is a journey that you and I take on our own. So when you find yourself enwrapped in sin, it's not that God has separated himself. It's that our window has become marred by what we're in. Our windshield wipers aren't on. And so then we jump into this sad story and we see that it didn't though end just with Adam and Eve. It went on to the next generation. I don't know how many of you are enveloped in generational sins that your mom and dad maybe have been in. Maybe your parents never talked to you about the mistakes that they made in life. Maybe they never expressed to you things that they did wrong. But see, the story goes on here in Genesis chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7. We see the story of Cain and Abel. Abel is offering his gift to God, and it's acceptable. But Cain's was not. And God looked on Cain with sadness after his offering wasn't accepted. And he said in verse 6, chapter 4, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you did what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But you must rule over it. Success can be attained in this life, but only on God's terms. Can I say that again? Does anyone see this? Success can be attained in this life, but only on God's terms. What are God's terms? I don't know about you, but I don't actually just jump into sin just like that. I don't. It's usually a step-by-step process. John Pauline, in his 
book talking about Revelation had this one interesting passage there where he talked about the steps to the secular drift. I found it so fascinating. I repeat this constantly when I preach because I'm just like, man, how does this come alive? How does sin just emerge in my life? It happens sequentially, one step at a time. Here he writes, step number one, private prayer ceases in your life. Step number two, Bible study is affected. Step number three, now personal standards of behavior start to erode. And this actually is the first sign of the secular drift. When you notice some of your buddies not here anymore, and then you see like, wow, I didn't know they do that stuff. That's the first sign you can actually see them drifting. It's because now what was happening inside starts emerging outside. Step number four, church attendance becomes irregular and becomes even a burden and a hassle. I found myself right there in step four. We moved from Loma Linda to Arkansas. No church that I could work at. There were no churches open. And now all of a sudden for the first time I looked at Elena. I don't even need to go to church. I don't have to preach a sermon. Let's just sleep in. I don't know how many of you have ever had a busy week. Anyone? Ever? And that temptation emerges over and over. And now it just becomes a burden and a hassle. Now you no longer want to go. And then step five, societal influence impacts you so much that you begin to doubt key beliefs, doubt the Bible, doubt the afterlife, doubt that God even exists. You see, the issue is that our desires are so frivolous. They're so weak. What do I mean by that? Listen to the words of C.S. Lewis in his sermon, The Weight of Glory. He says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord thinks our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because they cannot imagine what is meant by an offer at a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are so far too easily pleased with the enticements of this world that we don't understand the beauty that God has in store for us. Are those extra hours at work really worth it? How about the extra hours at the gym and the mall and the computer and the phone? Are all those extra hours worth it? Do they bring you more meaning in life? Do they draw you closer and closer to Jesus? Obviously, we keep doing those things because we think they're worth it. But I want to tell you, God thinks there is a good life for you to have in a consumer world. And it starts by understanding what he meant when a man talked to me in a pool locker room. Seems a little bit awkward of way of introducing this, huh? There I was changing out of my swimming suit and this Man over here to my side, he starts talking to me. I'm like, this is kind of awkward. I'm changing. But I change, and he keeps talking to me, and he starts, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing here at Andrews? How has your life been? Very good. Okay. And then he asks me, oh, you're a theology student. What is Matthew 6.33? Matthew 6.33? Why, that's... Why, that's... Uh, I didn't know. I had no idea. And then I felt angry. How dare this guy ask me what this Bible verse is? I'm a theology student, and my pride got the best of me. I realized I didn't know. You don't know, he said? You don't know? <laughs> he literally stopped talking to me, and he said, I'll see you at the, at the pool another time. Go look up what Matthew 6.33 says. I went to my dorm room 
and I looked it up. So let's start in verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, and then we'll jump to 33. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And then Matthew 6, 33. Therefore, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Can I read that one more time? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. You've fallen asleep, haven't you? That food that's downstairs is starting to emanate. It's coming up. Friends, when the kingdom becomes our number one concern, Jesus doesn't say don't attain success. Abraham was a wealthy man. The early patriarchs in Genesis and Exodus, wealthy people, attained much, the wealthiest in all the land. But how did they get it? By seeking first the kingdom of God. When we seek first the kingdom of God, wealth is not an issue, but don't think that God is all about wealth. You may be poor as a follower of Jesus, seeking first the kingdom. People have these statements about other cultures. Oh, Jews, man, they're so rich. You know, Jews, they are so, oh my good. Have you ever been to Israel? Have you ever been to Israel? Many portions of Israel, Jews who are very poor. They're following after God with their po- many Adventists, many Christians following after God with all their heart and yet they're suffering in poverty. Seeking first the kingdom doesn't mean we won't have earthly struggle, but we will have eternal joy. The measure of a good life in a consumer world will not be found by pushing your children to achieve significance in this world. Or you yourself, when you attain honor at work, education, or socially, or have an amazing spouse, or boyfriend, or girlfriend, all the while neglecting to prioritize the kingdom in your life personally and that of your family. It cannot be attained. A good life will never be had in God's eyes if we neglect the kingdom first. The problem is not hearing the words of Jesus, but it's actually living them out. Don McClafferty, in his book Inside Out, gives this story of a father who was starting to come back to church. He had unfortunately gotten a divorce from his wife, marriage that had fallen apart. And he was left with these two young boys. They lived with him at his home. He wanted to raise them well. And he started attending the church, and they got him in a small group. And as he's going to the small group, wow, all of these things that he knew as a boy were coming alive to him again. And he started dating a young woman, and he invited the woman to live in his home. He said, just come live with us. But his boys had seen him growing in Christ, and he was teaching them about Jesus. He was praying with them in the mornings and in the evenings, and Oh, man, Tata, we love you. Thank you for teaching us about Jesus. This is so wonderful. But then as this woman came into the home one night, they looked at their dad and said, Tata, why is she here? Why is she living with us? Is that what the Bible says? Ooh. (laughs) Ooh. Ooh. Out of the mouth of babes comes life. You see, this father wanted to live faithfully. And he realized he couldn't do that by having this woman living in their home. You see, in our lives, 
Christian parents, grandparents, church members who are older, we cannot expect our children to follow Christ further than we follow Christ currently. Where your faith level is, your children will either reach that, and if that means you have barely any faith in your everyday life, your children will have barely any faith in their life. They watch you. Do you have a vibrant walk with God? Do you have a committed relationship with Jesus? They will see that. They will mar that. They will, they will hold it against you and mar that. You see how it's been said, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. I don't know how you're going to translate that. <laughs> that was not funny. Okay. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your walk then you talk talks. Now I'm getting confused. Let me just say it like this. We're all preachers. Whether we like it or not, our life is a sermon. What is the message that the world hears? Your life is a sermon. What's the sermon your wife hears every day when you come home from work and you're totally stressed and it's been a long day? What's the sermon your life preaches when your sister looks at you and you're done with school? Oh my gosh, not one more homework assignment. What's the sermon your friends hear when you're around them? Every single one of us is a preacher. Don't forget that ever. What sermon is the world hearing from your life? In conclusion, I want to remind you of the beauty of what Ellen White talks about in her book, Adventist Home. She talks about the influence of a family being the most significant influence that the world can see. That will shape positively the future of nations, society, and the church for the better. Don't be discouraged if flooding in in your life are troubles and you're like, man, I don't look anything like Jesus. Because there's one thing that I skipped back in Genesis that I want to share with you now. You see, even though God banished Adam and Eve from the garden, he did something first before he did that. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Sometimes people forget the significance of what God did for them. There in verse 21 of Genesis 3, it says this. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and his wife, clothing them. What's the significance of that? God literally provided the first sacrifice. In the midst of our lives, in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our chaos, in the midst of God, I can't live up to this. He says, son, Daughter, I will live up to it for you. I've shown you that I will be with you. He gave them the first sacrifice. Pointing into the future, there would be a greater sacrifice of skin provided for them coming from his own flesh. Even though you and I may be attaining success or wondering, God, how am I going to attain anything? And you're wondering if I can cut corners in life. It's not about cutting corners. It's He's provided everything. He's the one who's provided the way and the measure of success for you and I. And it starts first on the cross. The measure of a good life is finding Jesus at the center of your life. And so today, in conclusion, I challenge you in this. Remember, hell is very long. But heaven is real. And there is an offer out for you. Heaven is long, heaven, hell is long, heaven is real, but the offer is there for you right now. Will you choose it? The invitation is here for you, for me, for all of us. Will we keep Jesus at the center? Will our priority be first seeking the kingdom and his righteousness and remembering God will bless us in the midst of all of that as we keep 
him first.